Thank you, sir. And first, I want to express my deep appreciation to Chairman Upton and Ranking Member to get on this bill. The funding and these innovative reforms will save lives, and that's something that everyone in this chamber should be proud of. There are a lot of wonderful provisions in this bill, and we should see those provisions through. I'm a member, Mr. Chairman, of the Rare Disease Caucus, and like most of us here, I've met with constituents with incredible stories of courage, stories of their battle with diseases without treatments. It would be easy to fall victim to despair, but they don't. There remain beacons of hope, hope for a treatment, hope for a world where no one else has to go through what they did. And they look to us to support them, to fight alongside them for these treatments and life-saving research, and I'm proud to stand with them and to fight for them. But there's a part of this bill that I believe will do more harm than good, and that's the part that deals with easing medical device safety regulations. While we bring our research and treatments into the 21st century, I think it's equally important we bring our medical device safety regulations into the 21st century as well. As part of a 21st century approach to medical devices, the FDA established a unique device identification system to adequately identify medical devices through their distribution and use. These codes can significantly improve safety and help track down dangerous recalled products. But currently, these UDIs are not incorporated into all electronic health records, which make it difficult to fully achieve the benefits to patient safety. For example, a claim form might list the procedure like a routine surgery to remove uterine fibroids, but not note the maker model of the device used, such as the laparoscopic power, power morselator, a device that the FDA placed a black box warning on. Some manufacturers have recalled, and some insurance companies have stopped covering as a result of its devastatingly adverse effects on women's health. It is this tragedy surrounding the power morselator that has driven me to action, and it's why I offered eight amendments to the Rules Committee that would strengthen our safety laws. This week, I've heard from dozens of these individuals affected by complications from power morselation. One doctor from California sent me a note about how her sister died nine months after a routine surgery with a power morselator. A woman from Massachusetts described her battle with the cancer spread by a morselator. Another constituent in New York, and these constituents wrote letters to their members of Congress and copied my office. She lost her sister to cancer spread by the morselator and described her sister's tragedy as a routine surgery ending with a death sentence. And a constituent of mine, a doctor and a mother of six children, who's courageously fighting an aggressive cancer that was spread by the blades of the device. What happened, Mr. Chairman, with the power morselator should never be allowed to happen again. And I think that we missed an opportunity with this bill to tackle this problem head on. In 2011, the Institute of Medicine found the current four-decade-old medical device safety process known as 510K inadequate, noting 510K process lacks the legal basis to be a reliable pre-market screen of the safety and effectiveness of moderate risk devices. I wish the bill had addressed this gap that allowed the power morselator to slip through and cause unnecessary harm to way too many families. So it's time we take our medical device safety regulations into the 21st century, and I ask my colleagues to join me in this effort and to support this amendment of mine today, which is a small but important step. I'm proud to stand for patient safety. I urge my colleagues to stand with me and the thousands of others who've been injured or killed by unsafe medical devices. Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen,